Session 75 of the Law of One and the final session of Book 3. Let's get today into martyrdom, something we've talked about in the past. Let's begin. Well, we got ourselves a sort of long session today because we have about 30 something or almost 40, I think, questions and answers. And some of them are pretty long and we can actually stay there a little bit uh, longer if we can, if we want to. And to make it even longer, because it's the last session of book three, doesn't mean anything, but to me, it's just like a closure <laughs> of third book of the law of one, um, which really doesn't mean anything because I'm actually using the raw contact, which this is like halfway through the second book of the raw contact. If you follow that whole uh, history of the material, but in any case, I, I want to make it a little longer. I usually don't read the book five material. There is a there's a long um, explanation by Jim and Carla about this, because this session deals with a lot of personal material. Carla was going to uh, undergo surgery, and they asked Ra a lot of questions about that. So we'll get into all of that. But first, I'm just going to read. Uh, I don't have it in, uh, in my slides, so I'll just read it from from the material itself. And I'm gonna start with Jim, which is, again, if you don't know, book five has all the personal material that was taken out and some other questions that were not relevant to the, what Don considered the law of one, what he wanted in the books. So in, I think it was 96, 98, I always forget the date for some reason, they, Jim and Carla made this book, which is all those questions and answers, they were included there and they gave commentary on the specific sessions. So in this case, on session 75, they talked about uh, the session itself in question. So without further ado, let's get into that. We're gonna talk about martyrdom towards the end, but the bulk of this video is going to be their personal material. So let's start with Jim. I don't usually read it, but uh, I thought it was interesting to read it because much of the material in this session is about them. So um, let's, let's see what they say. So Jim says, in session 75, we were trying to help Carla through her upcoming hand operation in a local hospital. When the raw contact began, the pre-incarnatively chosen arthritic limitations set in more strongly than ever. And Carla's desire to do things for others with hands that were meant to be restricted from mundane work brought more and more pain and damage to the arthritic joints, thus necessitating the operation for short-term repair. The length or success of the surgical repairs would depend upon Carla's growing ability to accept the limitations that she placed upon herself before the incarnation in order that her focus might move inward and prepare her for the possibility of becoming a channel. Her ability to accept these limitations delayed the next surgery for four years. So we begin to see uh, the picture of Carla who didn't accept her limitations and wanted to do more. This all goes into martyrdom and you will see it connect uh, throughout the whole uh, material or this material that I have for this video. But you can already see that Carla was always wanting to, to do work and help others and so on, right? That's what Jim is saying. He continues and says, since she had been a Christian mystic from birth, from birth, certain prayers of her Episcopalian church and the communication service in particular were felt by Ra to be of aid to her. The banishing ritual of the lesser pentagram, which we had been using for some time to purify our place of working for the raw contact, was suggested for her hospital room and the operating room. The greatest protective and healing device, however, 
was seen to be love, whether manifest or unspoken. For all any ritual such as prayer, communion, or the banishing ritual of the lesser pentagram actually does is alert positively polarized discarnate entities so that they may provide that quality which we call love from their quarters for whatever the purpose might be. Each of us may also provide that same love as a function of our truly caring for another. As we learn the lessons of love within this third density illusion, we are also learning the basics of healing and protection. So Jim now speaks about the portion of the banishing ritual, the understanding of rituals, the um, love being, of course, a foundation for any type of uh, protective work that you want to do, etc. All of this is part of the personal material that I'm going to cover of course, and those were the questions that were excluded. I think all of them were at the beginning. Uh, maybe some at the end. No, there's nothing at the end. It's all personal uh, material at the beginning. So Jim already in two paragraphs talked about the first um, Carlos martyrdom and then of course the banishing ritual, which we're going to get into. Um, but they learned, they learned that uh, in essence, and I'm getting ahead of myself, but they learned that the, the most, the protection doesn't lie in the ritual itself, the performing of it, but of course, you know, who you are alerting uh, or what kind of influence, cosmic influence are you alerting when you perform this sort of ritual. And of course, your intention and everything goes with it, most than anything. So, all right, we're getting to Carla now. She says, there are surprises in this material, even after all these years. It was not until this moment, writing in 1997, so yeah, it was 1998 when the book came out, that Jim and I realized we did not follow one of Ross's suggestions during that hospital experience. Jim, Don, and I vibrated the banishing ritual twice a day. Jim and I both remember that. Neither of us can recall reading the mass in any form. We just missed it. Imagine wasting Ra's advice. I know we did not do that in uh, on purpose. After 16 years, all we can say is that is that refrain of bosos everywhere. Oops. Has the hand holding when I meditated. All right, hold on. Let me let me make sense of this. <laughs> Uh, so apparently Ra also suggests that not only, as we'll see, that they do the banishing ritual mentally, but also the mass, which Carla was used to. That's what Jim said before. And so Ra suggested that she would use that as a sort of protective um, ritual as well, or uh, menta mentalization. And they didn't. So, yeah. As to the hand holding when I meditated, this was a practice that began began after a particular dis discomforting experience during one of our public meditation sessions. We talked about that. That's what generated the whole uh, five sessions, I think, of talking about this psychic attack. She continues and says, these were completely separate from the raw sessions. And any and all could come and check us out. I did not go into trends at these sessions as I did with raw sessions, but channeled from a very light trance state. However, during the question and answer period, someone asked a question to which I had no earthy idea about, and I thought to myself, I wish I were channeling Ra. Immediately, I began to leave my body, which was absolutely not to be done according to Ra. The source which I was channeling, La Tui, simply kept me channeling. Probably pure nonsense, but it sufficed to keep me in the body. After that, someone, usually Jim, always held my hand during sessions. To this day, Jim holds my hand as we meditate during our morning offering and at all meditation sessions we offer. Better safe than sorry is the cliche which covers this. So we have talked about this in the past and I won't mention much here. I will say that this session is available. Now you will have to uh, search 
between session seven, uh, 67 and uh, the last 60s, session 60s, 67, 8, 9 maybe session 70 but you will find there in the description the uh, channeling that she is referring to you can go all the way down where she starts to channel Ra <laughs> she actually says I am Ra and then she goes and uh, uh, goes on and then corrects herself and it's a little messy you can see the whole thing there so uh, go check it out if you want but that's what Carla's talking about I've talked about that already so she keeps going. I remember with great aff uh, let me reread that. <laughs> I remember with great affection the utter fidelity of love and concern that Don and Jim showed me during this time. It was very hard for Don especially to see me in pain, but he did not flinch or draw away, but rather tried ceaselessly to protect and aid me. The same could be said about Jim, but I think it was light years harder for Don to bear this than Jim. Jim is a simple, straightforward person. To him, what is, is. I remember asking him once if all he was going to say in this life was, yep, nope, or maybe. Yep, he replied. <laughs> then after considering, he said, nope. Then more consideration, and he finally settled on maybe <laughs> that's actually pretty funny i like it uh i relate to jim a lot <laughs> jim's jim's the man uh i'm so glad that i could do an interview with jim jim is <laughs> he's more a reflection to me than uh than don i believe at least in this context <laughs> to don my pain was his pain for we were truly one being in that ineffable sense which is beyond space and time the pain, severe though it was, did not overly distress me, but it foundered Don. His level of concern was profound. Now, just to add a little bit of history, Ra said that between the three of them, two of them had a relationship of um, teacher-student, and the other two, I think they were, uh, they had a very strong relationship. It's very difficult to play which had the relationship with Carla? Who was the teacher and the student? Or was Carla the teacher and the other one the student? But Carla seems to be the point here of connection, right? Uh, two were sixth density, one, were fifth, one was fifth density. So something for us to play with. I don't think anybody could say for sure. In any case, Carla continues and uh, says, through the years since this channeling, I have more and more come to appreciate Ra's suggestion that I fully accept my limitations. After my miraculous rehabilitation in 1992, she was very, very weak after Don's death and for years, I found myself out of the wheelchair and vertical for the first time in many years. A year ago, I was able to give the downstairs hospital bed back to Medicare I still find one helpful at night for sleeping. When I first started to rebuild a vertical life, I was full of ideas as to what I might accomplish. I tried going back to school to get myself current in my old field of library service. I tried to take a job. A, I volunteered at church far beyond my actual capacity to surf, and this took its toll. As I collected injuries, broken ankles, sprained knees, and two more hand operations. Finally, about a year ago, I managed to pare down my work to my point where I, to the point where I allowed much rest time within the schedule of the day. I've tinkered with the schedule, finding ways to harmonize my efforts with gyms, finding how to nurture myself, finding what priorities my life really has. I'm hopeful that I have at this point realized that these set limits to effort and have begun to cooperate with my destiny. I fully respect my pre-incarnative choices to take on these uncomfortable, uncomfortable limitations. The experience has hollowed me out and made me an ever better channel. 
I continue to rejoice as I, as I see little bits of my ego fall away. My prayer these days is, Lord, show me thy ways. There is much work left for me. A true idiot. A true idiot. But I exult in being upon my king's or the king's highway. So, this is Carla's... Um, see, I think uh, Jim said something about this. Her ability to accept these limitations delay the next surgery of four, for four years. So, as you see, as she accepted these limitations, as Carla is saying, she delayed her uh, other surgeries, hand surgeries. And so, yeah, that was, um, that was her path, which is just accepting what you had. We'll get to that. Uh, I wanted to say something else about this. Yeah, you see, Carla, this is one important part. She came out in 1992, apparently, of, uh, I don't know what's the history after 18, um, 1984 and 1992, eight years of a lot of struggle. Carla had gone through a lot of physical issues and illness. And in 1992, she finally was able to walk again that's what she calls the vertical life and in this vertical life she decided to go out again and study and help people and do all this stuff which really just uh took a toll on her body because she wasn't accepting her limitations so that um, set her it's almost like it's inevitable whatever you are supposed to do it's inevitable and things life will continue to shape that road for you it's a very um, enlightening, enlightening experience really to to see how your path is being shaped over and over again towards one direction, whatever that may be, and you just have to accept it and take away. You know that's what Carla says. Uh, I continue to rejoice as I see little bits of my ego fall away. Ego being you know that necessity to control that I I think I know what is best for me in the sense that, you know, I'll continue to go against what, what I have, you know, and, and that's a very humbling experience. It really is. Uh, I speak um, from experience. So, in continuing to see, of course, the, uh, the, what we call ego, that desire to control, you know, to believe that I am a separate self that needs to control reality, and not that I am being lived by the universe. That's the key difference. You see, and how, how do you convince yourself to that? Well, you have to explore, you have to investigate, you have to find out you. You have to find out who you are. Or you. That's the thing. You. All right. So, uh, with all this long introduction, I can finally go into the questions. I'll try to cover as much and uh, I'll definitely get out of the way all the... Um, the personal material and for that we do have slides um, the personal material I'll cover and I do want to get into the martyrdom of course so hopefully this long uh, this session is not extremely long or this this video rather okay so let's go into the first question that we have which is Don asking as usual could you first please give me the condition of the instrument Ra says, it is as previously stated, with some slight lessening of the reserve of vital energy due to the mental emotional distortions regarding what you call the future. Now, can I please make a joke here and say that <laughs> we hear this all the time. Um, well, maybe my joke is not that funny because previously I think she was doing better. Right in session 74, uh, previously stated, previously stated, more nearly towards what you call normal. Yeah, so from session 73, this was already uh, going okay. So now it's beginning to lower, right? I was just going to say that it's funny that um, her reserve vital energies were lower 
yet we got like 40 questions <laughs> very long session here so who knows where's the joke in there you know sometimes it's very short session i don't know we don't have a clear definition here and why do we want to count anyways all right so it is as previously stated with some slight lessening of the reserve of vital energy due to mental emotional distortions regarding what you call the future so she was worried about the future you drain yourself when you think about the future why because she was going through surgery soon and so she decided that she had to worry about it that, like we all do right so we drain some of our, our vital energies keep that in mind um, which is you know it's not something like oh, I'm worrying about the future I shouldn't worry about the future you can't do that if you're worrying about the future then do worry about the future go into it just go into it and don't reject it don't try to say because then you create a double block <laughs> uh, worrying about the future is already a block you know um, that you have to explore whatever that may be and then you rejecting that or repressing it just makes it even worse double pressure question two Don says, I felt that this session was advisable before the instrument has her hospital experience. She wished to ask a few questions, if possible, for those about those. First, is there anything that the instrument or we might do to improve the hospital experience or to aid the instrument in any way with respect to this? So going into surgery. Ross says, yes. There are ways of aiding the mental emotional state of this entity with the notation that this is only for this entity or one of like distortions. There is also a general thing which may be accomplished to improve the location which is called the hospital. The first aiding has to do with the vibration of the ritual with which this entity is most familiar and which this entity has long used to distort its perception of the one infinite creator. This is an helpful thing at any point in the diurnal period, but it's especially helpful as your sun body removes itself from your local site. Okay, <laughs> let's talk about that. Uh, so what can we do before her operation? First, uh, there are ways to aiding the mental emotional state of Carla. Noting, this is Ra saying, whoever reads this, this is just for this entity, or for somebody with the distortions, similar distortions. So <laughs> this is a warning, you know, this doesn't work for everybody. Um, it works for Carla and for the people who are like her. Very important point because, I mean, Ra knew, at least I learned that from the past, <laughs> that, um, you know, given information that may be helpful, everybody's going to say, and we can still see this in society, you know, uh, I don't know, drinking uh, lemon juice in the morning helps to burn fat. Oh my God, everybody's thinking. <laughs> Under certain conditions, it creates a specific environment in which, of course, it stimulates the burning of fat. And I mean, I can go on with analogies about diets and so on here because I can see the same pattern. People just say, well, I do this and this and this because it helps me burn fat, you know, <laughs> and yet they're not taking care of the most important thing, which is calories, you know, um, the same thing happens everywhere, really. And so I can see it here, too. Good thing Ra said it, you know, under these conditions. <laughs> There is also a general thing which may be accomplished to improve the location, which is called a hospital. So, um, I don't know which is the general way, but let's just go with the first one. It has to do with the ritual with which uh, the entity is most familiar. And, uh, oh, that general is the next one. Okay, I see. So this one. This is uh, Carla's, you see, when they say mm, the entity is most familiar and which this entity has long used to distort its perception of the one infinite creator, the way she worshipped God, see, um, whatever our definition of God, creator, source, whatever it may be, 
that which is reality right satchitananda whatever it is that we use to worship that we all do by the way even if you're not into spirituality which i'm saying i'm not saying you but anybody is worshiping reality from a material point of view let's just give that you know i am a physical being that i'm just going to die and that is you know what they worship and this is why you see people who have no interest whatsoever in philosophy psychology spirituality whatever and yet they love reality in a specific way and they're fine you know they are they are healthy they have no problems and all of this it's only when we believe that we have problems that we start well kind of incarnating that you know you become that problem <laughs> you think you're a problem well there you go you are that problem then uh the world is miserable well guess what you are miserable too <laughs> whatever you see in the world is you that's uh, so easy it is so easy okay so the entity has long used its distortion that's the that's the part that carla actually said in the beginning um when i read her piece in the commentary that they forgot to do they forgot to do this part which is the mass right visualizing the mass you know praying and all of this this is a helpful thing at any point in the diurnal period says ra but especially at sunset <laughs> or in ra's language as your sound body removes itself from your local site <laughs> oh my god why did i have to talk about this i mean why do they have to talk this way i don't know but it's funny i love it so the last thing is the general improvement which ra says the general improvement of the place of the performance of the ritual the general improvement of the place of the performance of the ritual of the purification of the place is known we may note that the distortion towards love as you call this spiritual emotional complex which is felt by each for this entity will be of aid whether this is expressed or unmanifest as there is no protection greater than love so um that's the banishing ritual which we're going to get into uh, but i'm just going to make the emphasis here that love is the greatest protection this is what jim said in his commentary love is the greatest protection so forget about everything else start with love and then see what comes out of love then make that your ritual how about that you know start always with love whatever it is that you're feeling love towards and love again it's not that sentimental romantic love that we have love is just what you feel you see can i get away with this today yes i can the primal distortions of the law of one are free will love and light free will is the simple um contraction of the narrowing of infinity into um into a focus that narrowing into the focus is called love what love produces is light so if you see yourself as these three primal distortions you know that your free will is that narrowing that possibility to narrow your focus of love into anything so for example i am recording this and you are watching this you see my love is into this moment your love is into this moment your free will has made you um, focus your attention to this whether you're listening to me or watching me what you're doing right now is that narrowing of that infinity what were they called infinite possibilities into this focus of love and that love uh, comes out as, as light light is the creation you're listening to my voice my voice is made out of light you are watching the screen the screen is made out of light not just this light but everything light is everything that you see or perceive any sense perception is light you see and then light returns to its source which is infinity which is you you see the full cycle here so start with love whatever it is that is love 
See, where you focus your attention. Now, I'm not gonna keep going here because <laughs> I completely digressed, but you get the point. Start with love, end with love, or as Ra says, begin and end with the creator, which is you. Okay, let's move on. Question three. Don says, do you mean that it would be valuable to perform the banishing ritual of the lesser pentagram in the room that, shall, that she will be a, occupying in the hospital? Ra says, this is correct. Don says, I was wondering about the operating room. That may, that might be very difficult. Would it be helpful there? Ra says, this is correct. We may note that it is always helpful. Therefore, it is not easy to posit a question or a query to which you would not receive the answer which we offer. This does not indicate that it is essential to purify a place. The power of visualization may aid in your support where you cannot intrude in your physical form. Yeah, it would be, <laughs> I would say, very difficult to go into the operating room and do the ritual with the doctors and the nurses there. <laughs> it would be very difficult. They would be um, pretty, um, not concerned, what's the word, uh, not worried. I don't know, they will be startled, maybe, about it, but whatever. The point is that, obviously, they couldn't do it. Um, so, what gives? Well, Rafers says that it is always helpful. You can do it everywhere. You can go walking in the streets and do the banishing ritual. You can go uh, to somebody's house and do it. You can do it everywhere. I mean, don't infringe on free will. <laughs> people's free will, which is, do they want you to be there? Uh, first question, <laughs> you see? But yeah, so it is always helpful, but this doesn't mean that you have to do it all the time. This does not indicate that it is essential to purify a place. Um, the power of visualization may aid you in your support where you cannot intrude in your physical form. I think this is more important than is laid out here obviously Ra was talking about the specific concern of Don not being able to do it physically and this is a good point to um, remark that Don brought that um, that part of our minds that wants to always uh, know the mechanics of things Ra was a mechanical guy and so by not being able to do it physically he was a little bit concerned I guess and Ra is saying well consider the possibility that in your imagination works as as good you see um, and I think this is also what I have you know uh, as much as I relate to Don's mechanical view of reality which I I enjoy I don't have a knack for ritual like I said uh, perform rituals however I'm a very ritualistic person if you can see me throughout my day I do the same things over and over again. I feel comfortable there. But I don't mind breaking them. You see, just not doing it. I know it does nothing for me to do the things this and that way. Um, but uh, the power of visualization is what I say that is um, not emphasized enough, perhaps, because I do think that visualizing is really the, um, the important uh, the important the beginning you see because you first visualize and then you perform so the performance is almost the physical performance i mean is almost like your uh, expression of that which you have visualized already but remember always roots roots is visualization right you cannot do something before you visualize it you first have to visualize it um i know some exceptions may apply you may do this something subconsciously or unconsciously and there was still some visualization even there <laughs> that you weren't aware of it that's another thing but there was some prior let's say it was time space before space time anyhow let's go on question five don says i see the way to do this is a visualization of the operating room and a visualization of the three of us performing the banishing ritual in the room 
as we perform it in another location. Is this the correct procedure? Ra says, this is one correct method of achieving your desired configuration. Again, mechanical uh, done. And it goes on, but you see, Ra is already saying, what the way you, you told me and you visualize it is one correct method. It seems fine. Ra is basically saying, yeah, that's fine. Okay. Um, that's okay. And so Don, being mechanical, is going to ask, is there a better method than that? Ra says, there are better methods for those more practice. For this group, this method is well. Um, I guess Ra can see the potentialities among the three and say, the way you visualize it is fine. I don't think you guys can do anything else. They don't see that potential. Uh, not the potential, the availability, the probability of them doing it in a different way. They require more practice, as uh, Ra suggested. And what is this practice? Well, let's find out. Don, actually very uh, perceptive, says, I would assume those more practice would leave their physical bodies and in order, in the other body, enter the room and practice the banishing ritual. Is this what you mean? And Ra says, this is correct. So somebody who is more practiced can actually go out of their body like an astral projection and perform the ritual there. Now, what is the difference here? First, somebody who can achieve astral projection naturally has trained itself to be much more aware within time space, right? Their minds in uh, the physical reality. So that's not something I have training. I have no practice whatsoever, so I cannot speak about it. Um, it's something that some people have a tendency and a natural ability to do, um, or both, you see, and, or either, and they do it. So that's another way. Uh, but basically what Ra is saying is yes you know it's possible that you can leave your body and go there and that would be a little bit more effective i guess if you can't be in the place right but um it, it's all about how you want to purify now remember all of this is preceded or yes is preceded by love love is the greatest protection that's it and you know i i yeah, let me not go there. Let's just keep going. So I'll just keep going and on and on. Question eight. Don says, the instrument would like to know if she can meditate in the hospital without someone holding her hand. And would this be a safe practice? Ra says, we might suggest that the instrument may pray with safety, but only meditate with another entity's tactile protection. Carla came here to become a channel. If that wasn't clear already, <laughs> we can see it. Um, so, her sensibility, along with, let's just say, her whole configuration made her susceptible to the possible um, psychic attacks, as we call them, psychic greeting, as Elena Research decided to call it. And um, because she was susceptible to this, then every time she meditated for uh, for this purposes, or for any purpose, I would say, where she would just, meditation is going into trends for her. She would have to have that hand holding. And that's why Carla said that she, she never left Jim's hand when meditating uh, for channeling. And that's, I mean, it just paints a beautiful picture, right? I can just picture them in their bungalow in uh, Kentucky. I don't know, just a, like a Bob Ross picture, a landscape with them there, <laughs> uh, meditating. I don't know why I got that picture, but beautiful. In any case, so that's Carla's, um, Ross suggestions for Carla, that they, they go into, she can pray, but not meditate. So, more material, personal material, Don says in question nine, 
The instrument would like to know what she can do to improve the condition of her back, as she says it could be a problem for the operation. Ross says, as we scan the physical complex, we find several factors contributing to one general distortion experienced by the instrument. Those of these, I correct myself, two of these distortions have been diagnosed. One has not. Or will the entity, nor will the entity be willing to accept the chemicals sufficient to cause cessation of the distortion you call pain. All right, so I read this. Uh, I read that pretty bad. What's going on with my English today? All right, so Ra says, as we scan the physical complex, this is to improve her back, right? That's what Don is saying. To improve the condition of her back. Um, she thought this could be a problem for her operation. And Ra said, as we scan the physical complex, we find several factors contributing to one general distortion experienced by the instrument. Uh, so several factors contributing to the to one general distortion two of these distortions <laughs> he says they say one general distortion then two two of these general distortions have been diagnosed uh, one has not nor will the entity be willing to accept the chemical sufficient to cause cessation of this distortion you call pain so she was uh, um, she, she didn't want to take pain medicine, uh, painkillers, I guess. I don't blame her. I've taken them and I think they are just awful. <laughs> I'd rather feel my pain. Um, and sometimes they didn't even do anything, so why why take them? That's just me. Uh, what else they have? They say, in general, we may say that the soul modality addressing itself specifically to all three contributing distortions which is not now being used, is that of the warmed water, which is moved with gentle force repeatedly against the entire physical complex, while the physical vehicle is seated. This would be of some aid if practiced daily after the exercise period. So basically, the other way to address her back pain and issues was to sit down in a sort of um, uh, whirlpool, not whirlpool, uh, is that what it's called? A jacuzzi? Uh, that kind of just, I know they have different names for it, but just, yeah. A device where you are immersed in water and then there is swirling of waters and just this, um, yeah, this, have the word in, in Spanish, swirling of waters. I know Ross says this word, so I'll use that. And I think they started using this. So warm water, then swirling of waters, which create this massage sort of thing. It's um, very relaxing, and especially after the exercises. So good advice, good advice for recovery. Question 10, Don says, did the exercise of the fire that was just performed before the session help the instrument? Ra says, there was some slight physical aid to the instrument. This will enlarge itself as the practitioner learns, teaches its healing art. Further, there is a distortion or there is distortion in the mental emotional complex which feeds the vital energy towards comfort due to support which tends to build up the level of vital energy as this entity is a sensitive instrument. So again, I don't know what the exercise of fire is. Uh, it seems to be something that was physical energy transferred. That's something they did. I'm not sure where it came from, but Ross says that there was some slight physical aid to this, to the instrument because energy transfer, physical energy transfer, this will enlarge itself as the practitioner learns, teaches, learns, teaches its healing arts. So as they become more proficient with the exercise of fire, it'll help. Further, there is a distortion in the mental emotional complex, which feeds the vital energy towards comfort due to support, which tends to build up the level of vital energy as this entity is a sensitive instrument. So I guess, this next or final part is all about the um, 
See, when they say there's distortion in the mental emotional complex of Carla by feeling, right? I don't know. Uh, this sounds to me uh, because it's towards the comfort, uh, towards comfort, comfort due to support, which tends to build up the vital energy. To me, this means um, when you feel loved, when you feel that mental, emotional support from somebody else. So the access of Sapphire to me creates a sort of physical energy transfer, but there's also Carla feeling loved by, oh, they're performing this for me. How lovely. And she feels better. That increases her vital energies. That's my take on it. Don says, was the exercise of fire properly done or performed? Ra says, the baton is well visualized. The conductor will learn to hear the entire score of the great music of its art. That's a very poetic way of saying, yes, um, you, you have grasped the meaning of it and you will continue to learn more. Don says, I assume that if this can be fully accomplished today, that exercise would result in total healing of the distortions of the instrument to such an extent that operations would be unnecessary. Is this correct? Ra says, no. Uh, yeah, very simple, that, that wouldn't work. Don says, what else is necessary? The instrument's acceptance? Ra says, this is correct. The case with this instrument being, the case with this instrument being delicate, since it must totally accept much which the limitations it now experiences cause to occur involuntarily. This is a pre-incarnative choice or pre-incarnative choice. <sighs> so yeah, Don's sort of naivety to believe that just performing uh, perfectly, the ritual can just, uh, or the exercise of fire can totally heal somebody. It's not how it works. I also believe this is not how miracles work or worked with Jesus. And we're gonna get into Jesus now. I think there was uh, some exaggeration as we will see from Jesus' historical uh, accounts. So yeah, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't seem to work that way. Now, the thing is acceptance. That is the thing, you see? And I think this is how Jesus worked his miracles acceptance people had to have acceptance uh, so Ra says this is correct the case with the instrument with this instrument being delicate since it must totally accept much which the limitations it now experiences causes to occur involuntarily so she basically has to accept those things that are happening involuntarily um, and the experiences that are being caused by that right um, so basically just accept everything. But once again, I, I find this to be limiting to just say, accept everything. Like this is something that you do. You first need to know who are you, right? Like uh, the trouble is, and I, I don't, I don't want to sound repetitive, but it's, um, I don't have another direction to point out other than yourself. What is, that you, what is it that you are, you see? Um, and how can you accept all of this? Well, you don't have to do it consciously. I mean, consciously, it will happen when you realize that all you are is that acceptance. I kind of gave you a hint with the um, free will, love, and light, how that is all being automatically being generated by the sheer fact that we are alive. So if you can pick that and know that acceptance is what you are. It's not something you do. That's the key thing. But I won't go into more details because we have a long answer here and I want to cover it. Or a long question, question answer. Let's get into that. We're out of the material, the personal material. Now we get into question 14. We're done says the instrument would like to know why twice at the Benedictus portion of the music that she practices, did she experience what she believes to be a psychic attack? Uh, so first thing, this is a sort of long answer 
and a lot to get out of this. I just want to mention that Jim corrected this, or not corrected, but suggested strongly that there is a correction here. Nothing big, just me being a nerd and including this. Um, but Don is saying that there was um, a portion of the music that she practices, right? Like she was practicing. And Jim says that no, he remembers vividly being there. It was not practice, it was an actual performance at church. Because when he heard about this, he said, I would, he remembers saying in his head, if I would, would have known this, I would have jumped into the, you know, the scenario or whatever to help her out. Like that was his thought. So he remembers this, that this wasn't practice. So Don just didn't remember well. That doesn't account to anything. That's just me pointing it out. So, all right, let's get into Ra's uh, answer. What is it? What happened there? Hmm. Benedictus being a prayer in the that is chanted in church, and she felt a psychic attack. So Ra says, "This is not a minor query. We shall first remove the notations which are minor. In the vibrating, which you call singing." of the portion of what this instrument hallows, or hollows, I don't know how to pronounce that, hallows, right, something hollow as the mass. I'm gonna pronounce it hollow. Okay, so that which uh, she, of the portion of what this instrument hallows as the mass, which immediately precedes that which is the chink called the Hosanna. There is an amount of physical exertion required that is exhausting to an entity. This portion of which we speak is termed the Sanctus. We come now to the matter of interest. I'll keep reading. When the entity Jehoshua, which is Jesus, biblical Jesus, decided to return to the location called Jerusalem for the holy days of its people, it turned from work mixing love and it turned from work mixing love and wisdom and embraced martyrdom. Uh, which is the work of love without wisdom. Okay, so this whole thing, I don't know how much I want to give. You know what? I'm just going to read the whole thing and then go back to it. So, Ra says, The Hosanna, as it is termed, the following Benedictus, is that which is written, is the written summation of what was shouted at Jehoshua came into the place of its martyrdom. Did I read that right? Let me read it again. The Hosanna, as it is termed, and the following Benedictus, Benedictus, is that which is written, is the written summation of what was shouted as Jehoshua came into the place of its martyrdom. Somehow it just feels off. The general acceptance of this shout, Hosanna to the son of David, Hosanna in the highest, blessed, is he who comes in the name of the Lord. By that which is called the church has been a misstatement of occurrence which has been perhaps unfortunate, for it is more distorted than much of the so-called mass. Ra continues and says, there were those factions present to greet Jehoshua. Firstly, a small group of those which hoped for an earthly king. However, Jehoshua rode upon an ass stating by its very demeanor that it was no earthly king and wished no fight with Roman or Sadducee. The greater number were those which had been instructed by rabbi and elder to make jest of this entity, for those of the hierarchy feared this entity who seemed to be one of them, giving respect to their laws and then, in their eyes, betraying those time-honored laws and taking the people with it. The chink for this instrument is the subtle situation which echoes down through your space-time, and more than this, the place the Hosanna holds as the harbinger of that turning to martyrdom. Ra finishes and says, we may speak only generally here. The instrument did not experience the full force of the greeting which it correctly identified during the Hosanna due to the intense concentration necessary to vibrate its portion of that composition. However, the Benedictus in this particular rendition of these words is vibrated by one entity, 
Thus, the instrument relaxed its concentration and was immediately open to the fuller greeting. Okay, now I have to return like 10 pages. <laughs> this was a long answer. But it won't take me as long. I lie. It's going to take me long to unpack all of this. <laughs> Uh, I may have to do a recap in the next video about this because it's relevant for the next uh, portions of the conversation. Okie dokie. So, what's happening? So, the whole setting is that Carla is chanting a song, right? That is regarded as the... Um, a symbology referent to when Jesus came back to Jerusalem and it was regarded as the Savior. Now, this is what happened, according to Ra, and it does make sense. Uh, Jesus came back, sitting on an ass, and uh, people were gathered because they were saying, oh, this guy who is, you know, uh, has a reputation is coming to Jerusalem. Now, he had already got a reputation, as it seems, among, um, you know, the rabbi and other uh, spiritual people of the time as somebody who understood the law, who obeyed the law, but somehow betrayed it, right? In their eyes, as Ra says, he betrayed it. And so he wasn't received as people, or at least... Um, let's say religion wanted us to believe we tend to embellish things in history so historical accuracy does bear a sort of weight into what we talk about so you know when we joke <laughs> Hitler did nothing wrong uh, well you know we're kind of uh, buying into something <laughs> It's it's kind of interesting, you see. So we have to be very careful with what we talk about and we say, especially historical things, because I mean I'm not saying that he did anything wrong. According to Ra, there there are no mistakes, of course, right? So we have to we have to make sure what we're doing. And in this case, we are worshiping an individual, right? Jesus. Let me state beforehand. I don't worship Jesus. Uh, even though I have not right there, right? And of course, I'm Spanish. There are rosaries in my house because we are Spanish, <laughs> you know, but I don't worship it. Um, and I don't deny Jesus either, you know. The dude was a dude. He believed um, he, um, he had to do something for humanity, and he did. He lived with all his heart. And that's, that's the thing we we pedestalize people okay so i stand in the middle i don't worship i don't deny it i believe what he was was just a man with um what we call yes uh christ consciousness loving heart you know all loving embracing person this portion of the um of the raw material talks about this in great detail because the Hosanna Hosanna is a term uh, if I remember I know my friend Brian is gonna correct me here or enhance on it um, this is um, it's a sort of um, prayer right for uh, the great Hosanna I know it's something in Hebrew uh, Hosanna I think it's pronounced but I won't even go into that <laughs> because I don't know, uh, but it is a is a Jewish term, right? And then it was used to celebrate, you know, or talk about Jesus, his entrance. His entrance was not as we believe in the Benedictus, right, or the Sanctus, uh, rather, right? We speak as a term the Sanctus. No, the Benedictus is the. Um, I think it is. I forget. I think the ben the Benedictus is the prayer, right? You know what? I'm not sure. Doesn't matter. So at that point, um, that prayer 
we we are opening ourselves to oh yes this is what happened jesus right and that's the opening that happened so okay that's the whole thing carlo was singing this it's not historically accurate and there is a lot of passion when you talk about this right you have a passion or you say oh this is how it was i think this is also the opening for orion to influence when people are so fanatic to text to people to things because when you are so fanatic about something you're liable to make mistakes into the interpretation obviously and then <laughs> orion would come and say ah yeah here we go you know we can influence we can manipulate this because you're not open you're narrow-minded and so you think that way anyhow so this we can talk about at the last paragraph but here so rise saying let's first remove the notations which are minor in the vibrating which you call singing so just singing of the portion of the what this instrument hallows as the mass that's a very important phrase she hallows uh if i'm pronouncing that might be hollows but english has no way to know if you don't know the word you have no idea how to pronounce it so hallows right if um hallowing means to make sacred to make holy right so whatever she considered this to be like the portion of complete opening of my god yes this is it which immediately precedes that which is the chink called the hosanna so first there's a big opening you're opening yourself right uh, the way i see it please don't believe me it's just uh, how i perceive it so when that chink there is a, a chink means uh like an opening in the armor an opening in yourself so there is no not only the opening of yourself willingly but there's also a flaw right that's the flaw i would call it a, a flaw as a synonym for chink the hosanna there is an amount of physical exertion required that is exhausting to an to any entity right when you chanted this with your with all your passion this portion of which we speak is termed the sanctus okay so the sanctus is mm, the moment i guess we'll see we come now to the matter of interest ah okay when the entity Jehoshua or Jesus decided to return to the location called Jerusalem for the holy days of its people, it turned from work, mixing love and wisdom, and embraced martyrdom. So Jesus was being initiated into all of this, and he realized, you know, he's working, it's beautiful actually, what Ron says here. In his formation, in his education, in his ways of becoming aware of its true purpose, um, Jesus turned from mixing love and wisdom to embrace martyrdom. So basically, love, complete love. This is why Jesus is known to be the reference for love. And again, I will say here, there is a lot of stigma into saying like, oh, I have to become like Jesus. Oh my God, I have to be like Jesus. You don't and you can't. And hopefully you don't. <laughs> Please don't. Please, we don't need another Jesus. It's not possible to have another Jesus either. Jesus was perfect in, in his martyrdom. We could say also, uh, you see, Jesus was flawed. He was open to martyrdom. No, he wasn't. He was perfectly balanced that way. And we are perfectly balanced the way we are. We just need to accept it. And Jesus accepted himself, period. All right. This is the work of love without wisdom. That's what Jesus embraced, you see? That's not wrong. That's what Jesus wanted to do. That's what God wanted to do through Jesus. Let me put it that way. Take Jesus as it's a feel it's an entity. No, God wanted to express itself as pure love right there. You know, it's just part of its play, of its act. Stop seeing it. We have to stop seeing it as something that is, oh, you know, everything is just random. No. God knows what it's playing. It's his art, music, it's play. And we are just the actors. We, the separate selves, are the actors. So we have to know that we are God. <laughs> so we stop believing that, oh, God is manipulating me. No, you are God. And you are actor and character at the same time. Is that so difficult to understand? I hope not. All right, so Ra says the Hosanna, as it is termed, and the following Benedictus. So Sanctus might be the, the prayer or the chanting. 
The following Benedictus is that which is the written summation of what was shouted as Jehoshua came into the place of its martyrdom. Okay, so that's the summation, right? That's what we think happened. The general acceptance of this shout is Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna in, in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's what was apparently shouted. You know, we all chant this and say, oh, this is how we visualize Jesus coming. But <laughs> his entrance was completely different. By that which is called the church has been a misstatement of occurrence, which has been perhaps unfortunate, for it is more distorted than much of the so-called mass. So it's the part of the mass that is completely distorted or totally taken out of context. <laughs> That's not what happened. Now, Ra explains what happens, and this makes a lot of sense. Ra says, there were two factions present to greet Yehoshua. Firstly, a small group of those which hoped for an earthly king. However, Jehoshua rode upon an ass, stating by its very demeanor that it was no earthly king and wished no fight with Roman or Sadducee. Uh, or Sadducee, I don't know how to pronounce that. But this is the first faction, right? There was a group of people, um, two factions. Yeah, a small group, firstly, a small group of those which hope for an earthly king. So everybody was hoping, like, oh, this guy's an influence. He's a big influence. So he is going to help us in the fight against the Romans because we are being oppressed by the Romans. Who weren't back in the time, right? This was the Roman Empire was thriving or beginning to decline, perhaps. You may, uh, you may see it both ways. That's the, the point of decline, perhaps. Um, in any case, uh, I think Octavius was still, I don't know, I forget. I forget my history in, in those hundred years before Jesus. So, was it Octavius or Octavian? Whatever. Uh, Octavius. So, um, yeah, this faction was completely disappointed because Jesus, this highly influenced person, no, he wasn't going to play his game, their game of... Uh, political power and social control because yeah that's the way we, we got to fight back the Romans and the uh, Sadducees I would pronounce Sadducees um, so no that's the first faction they were disappointed and I can imagine them saying like ah oh, he's just another hippie let's go see <laughs> uh, not Hosanna here comes the son of David and so on Jesus was pretty hated man as you can see so he wasn't liked, uh, he wasn't loved, uh, but by, by a, a few people, right? Okay, so the greater number, the vast majority of people who were there to greet Jesus were those which had been instructed by rabbi, an elder, to make jest of this entity. For those of the hierarchy feared this entity who seemed to be one of them, giving respect to their laws and then in their eyes, in the eyes of the hierarchy of the rabbi and the whole uh, Jewish system, betraying those time honor laws and taking the people with it. See, so the vast majority were religious people who were to a degree, to a spectrum of a degree or to a degree in the spectrum of fa fanatism or zealotry to say, uh, oh, this guy gave respect to our laws and now he's betraying them uh, and taking the people with him. So the funny thing is that they were instructor. The greater number were instructed by rabbi. So it wasn't just like, you know, all rabbis there. The, ra the rabbis, this is the kind of attitude that develops when you become too uh, fanatic, obviously, because you say, oh, we got to go make fun of that guy. Who in their right mind, and I say this with all property, who in their right mind would call this type of attitude against somebody else? I mean, if he's crazy, then let him be crazy. If he's off, then he's off. And even that is a judgment. But even if you have to live with the judgment of, you know, uh, touting people into craziness, that's fine. You know, stay with that. Don't go and mock them. You see, 
the thing right now, it, which is completely <laughs> a parallel right near, uh, right here, is conspiracy theorists. They get mocked, and they, you know, some people get paid to mock them. The, the whole online arena is so festering, you know, with people and shills and uh, larps and the whole thing. It's the same arena. You see, you have people talking their truth. That's what they see, and they're being mocked and ridiculed. So there's something actually true about that. You see, <laughs> you pay attention to that. Um, so the rabbi were, you know, the the kind of NSA at the time, the CIA, <laughs> at least in this specific context, right? Uh, the elder, rabbi and elder, to make jest of this entity. That's pretty low, man. That's very low. Um, they instructed people to do this. Shame on them. <laughs> For those of the hierarchy feared this entity who seemed to be one of them. See, they feared that he would, he seemed to be one of them. I mean, I understand. Their fear was that, oh my God, this guy is loved by some people and he actually uses our terms to, to talk to people. And lo and behold, people are following him. So we need to do something to um, discredit this person. And they were acting this way. You can see, you can see what they were doing. Um, because they thought he was betraying their time-honored laws. That's a beautiful way to put it, you know. Forget about laws. Forget about everything. You have to go back to basics. You see, this is where you get too much into your own teachings and, oh, this is, this is the, the thing. No, I mean, it's like reading somebody and saying, wow, this guy speaks the truth. And the truth I can read and feel. That's awesome. That's great. But I don't worship it. I don't worship the word. I don't worship the man. I don't worship the law. I don't worship the sin. I don't worship the system or anything. Nothing at all. That's because, I mean, that doesn't mean don't love it. You see, there's so much to clear up here that I won't take the time to do. But um, I do have a, a Zen story that is beautiful for this. There was this Zen master called Banke and um, he was known by just giving his uh, his teachings to everybody, and all type of people just followed him. And so there was this priest who was upset, this priest from a Buddhist sect, I forget the name, um, and he goes into one of Banke's um, teachings and interrupts it and says, hey, Zen master, Everybody who follows you must respect you, but I don't respect you. And so how can you make me follow you or obey you? And so Banke calls him and says, come here and I'll teach you, I'll show you. And so the priest, all proud, you know, puffed up, you know, made his way through the audience and got in front of him and said, stand next to me so we can talk. Banke tells to the, to the priest. And so the priest moved to the left. He says, no, no, no to the right, so we can talk better. So the priest moves to the right, and he says, you see, you seem to obey pretty fine, and I think you're a gentle person. Now sit down and listen. See, this priest was the rabbi who was upset that this guy was uh, the Zen teacher, Banke, would actually grab from his own, this is a priest, I forgot to mention that this priest was from a Buddhist sect, and a lot of his students were leaving him to go to listen to Banke, because Banke was talking about Zen. And um, it's the same situation. Jesus was talking in an open way. Jesus was a Zen master, if you will. I mean, I can go on for a while. <laughs> uh, Jesus was a Zen master, and so he attracted a lot of people that, you know, of course, Jesus couldn't use um, other language than the one he knew, Hebrew. And he used those words. And, of course, those who held those words dear would always say, I mean, there's so many parts where, there's another one where Jesus is talking to, um, to the rabbi and the elders there. And they were saying, you know, like, just, you know, uh, you should respect the law and all of this. And 
Um, I think there's a part where Jesus says like, oh, I think it's because he was saying that he was the son of God. I think I mentioned this in the past. And he was saying, I am the son of God. You know, I'm, I am that. And oh, how can you say that and all of this? And, you know, Jesus cites even the word and says, well, don't you say that you should worship the law all the time or the word? It says there that we're all, you know, God's uh, children. See, but so is the interpretation and all of that. So this is what actually happened. And um, this chink that Ra calls was the, let's say, Ra says the chink for this instrument is the subtle situation which echoes down through your space-time history. And more than this, the place the Hosanna holds as the harbinger of that turning to martyrdom. That's a very important part for Carla because you see the Hosanna as it is chanted is talking about the moment where Jesus said, I am here to devote myself. You see, he wasn't smart in the way of wisdom, I'm saying, to um, give his teachings in a way that was, you know, uh, less open, open hearted. You see, so he gave himself into martyrdom. And this is especially important for Carla, or sensitive for Carla. Ra says, we may speak only generally here. The instrument did not experience the full force of the greeting, which is, which it correctly identified during the Hosanna, due to the intense concentration necessary to vibrate its portion of that composition. So she was very focused on what she was uh, chanting, and so she didn't feel the full greeting. However, the Benedictus in this particular rendition of these words is vibrated by one entity. Thus the instrument relaxed its concentra concentration and was immediately open to the fuller greeting. This part I'm a little confused. In this particular rendition of these words is vibrated by one entity. Thus the instrument relaxed its concentration. I don't know why she had to relax the concentration because she was the one uh, chanting the Benedictus and was immediately open to the fuller greeting. Um, so I guess at the point of the Benedictus um, is when she was attacked. I don't know if this is discussed uh, later. I know there's a discussion, but it goes uh, not wrong, but yeah, wrong. Don takes it, uh, believes it's another entity that Ra is talking about. Yeah, I think there's more to... We'll cover this in, in the next uh, video. But there has to be something within the Hosanna. Um, that, yeah, there's a play there between how concentrated she was. Because first, Ra says, the instrument did not experience the full force of the greeting, which is correctly identified during the Hosanna, due to the intense concentration necessary. Okay. However, the Benedictus in this particular rendition of these words is vibrated by one entity. All right, so maybe, yes, there was a lot of concentration during the Hosanna, but during the Benedictus, um, the words are vibrated by, by one entity. Ah, okay, so she relaxed, of course. She, she wasn't the one, I'm thinking, right? The Benedictus in this particular rendition of these words is vibrated by one entity. So this part is chanted by just one person. Carla was chanting Hosanna, I believe. And then she relaxed, obviously because she wasn't uh, chanting. And then she was immediately open to the fuller greeting. That makes sense. At least the way I read it. I could be wrong. So yeah, that's... Um, I talked about in different ways, the metaphysical opening that happened in this particular case for the greeting. I think there was more to talk about the, the full history and everything than the opening that happened. But if you're interested, that's what happened. Um, she was chanting and in that chanting, not only did she open herself passionately to, uh, to the prayer, which I, I think is called the Sanctus, um, but also there was a chink or a flaw in this, which I think is the historical inaccurate part where they're saying, oh yes, they greeted Jesus, you know, with blessings and all of this, where in fact he was greeted with scorn and mockery and 
the usual stuff with Jesus, right? And there's also the point, you have to connect all of this if you want to understand it. Um, there's also the point of Jesus becoming a martyr at that point. He became a martyr. He knew that he would have to become a martyr. He just saw it. He said, well, nobody cares about what I say. And I, I know that I will become this because I cannot stop being who I am. This is just my words. That's not what he said, but just what I think. And the parallel is that Carla, guess what? She was sensitive to martyrdom, as she said. So, yes, there's a lot to take in here. And why Carla was sensitive to this particular um, situation, let's just call it that, moment, event. I bet Carla changed the way she sang or chanted this Hosanna part, knowing what happened uh, to Jesus. And I know that she adapted it in a very particular way. But that's all I got for this video. Uh, like I said, this will probably be covered in three parts because there's a lot more to talk about. Conclusions. Let's see. I don't think I had anything in particular here other than the historical part of Jesus, the whole um, psychic attack, everything else that was done with Carla. I don't have anything in particular, but to just recap, um, rituals are not important or not as important. You don't have to do them physically. You can do it. You can visualize them, as Ross said. The, more, the most important thing with rituals is that you ascribe some sort of passion to it, right? That you, you believe it, you give substance to it, you give life to it. So if you are one of doing rituals, then give life to it and feel them. You can always visualize and you don't have to follow a specific thing. Um, also, the idea of and I think this is more important. Uh, yeah, this will probably be the conclusion of this video because we talked about martyrdom. There's a lot of people that I see, let, let me put it this way, so I don't talk about people. There is a tendency in the mind, the human mind, to go towards martyrdom, especially when you become spiritually uh, enlightened, awakened, whatever you want to call it. When you become interested in these topics, and you hear, especially in the raw material, let me give you this. A lot of people say, oh, service to others. I have to become service to others. So now I need to be of service, physical service to people. This is a misconception in my point of view of what service is. Because what happens in the lines of martyrdom, people start to, um, under this mental influence, people start to be more um, they neglect themselves to serve others for some reason. There's even the misconception to believe that you know, taking care of yourself is service to self. This is not true, obviously. In fact, Ra even said, I forgot which session, which session 30 something. I just did the translations or reviewed the translations. And Ra says that, yeah, there is a service to self because Don, Don was the one who said, wait a minute, if only God exists or the creator, then all service is to the self. If self is the only thing that exists, then all service is to the self. And Ra said, this is correct. Um, what we term negative polarity as service to self is a different thing because service to others is service to self, but service to self alone is not service to others. So that's where the power of service to others comes into because you are seeing others as the self, as you. But for that, you cannot exist, right? You cannot be, you cannot exist as a separate being. You must exist as a whole. You are a drop in the ocean, but you are the ocean. A drop is just another expression of the ocean. You can be a current, you can be everything. You are everything, you are the ocean. And so my point is that there is this tendency in the mind to go towards martyrdom, especially with 
Jesus being in a pedestal and everybody saying, I have to be loving as Jesus. Well, you don't have to. And I can say that with property. You don't have to become like Jesus because you can't. Jesus is just a reference, just like you don't and can't become a Buddha. Buddha is your nature. Love is your nature. See what I mean? These are the influences that you follow. And ah, this guy right here, Jesus represents love in our culture. This guy right here, Gautama, represents uh, pure consciousness, the self. So, yes, it's always nice to have symbology that you just look at it and you say, yeah, that's awesome, you know, but don't worship. And if you're going to worship, worship in the sense of zealotry. Worship can be used. The word worship can be used in different ways. I am aware of that. Fret not. But yes, this is the this is the tendency that I see. With that in mind, um, yes, just pay attention to that. Love yourself. You can only love others if you love yourself. I cannot state that enough. You cannot love others if you don't love yourself. In fact, what you don't love in others is what you don't love in yourself. So you see, the path to the outside is the inside. Go inside as much as you're capable of every day and find and love everything that you are. Then you're more ready to love the outer world. I'm in my own process of doing this. I am not a... I'm not talking from, from the pedestal. <laughs> I can't be. And we all have our distortions. So that's my, my suggestion. That's all I got for today then. I appreciate you getting this far. An hour and a half almost. And in the next session or next video, I'm going to continue with the session. Part two, definitely three parts for this uh, session 75. Last one of book three. We're getting towards the end of the raw material, but we still have another 25, 26, 27% more to go. So hope you follow me on that. Take care. I'll see you next time.